afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's live science series with Berkeley Lab and Berkeley Lab scientists. Today, we'll be talking about X-ray crystallography, and we have a few people who will walk through um, what we do here at Berkeley National Laboratory with X-ray crystallography, crystals, light scattering, and much more. So my name is Faith Dukes. I am the K-12 STEM education uh, program coordinator here, program manager here at Berkeley Lab. And again, you're tuning into our advanced light source um, live science series. And if you haven't already started to follow us, please follow us on the following social media accounts on Twitter. Some quick reminders and information for today. First, make sure you've downloaded the sheet that's used to um, go along with this science series. Um, in the Q&A and chat box, you can ask all questions. And yes, we are planning to record and post this live science series uh, program. And for today, we are going over our agenda, which will be an introduction to the advanced light source, uh, making crystals with one of our scientists, Dula Parkinson, uh, talking about the light spectrum and electro electromagnetic uh, spectrum, as well as a light scattering demonstration, and finally talking about how the ALS is helping us uh, research COVID-19. At the end of this, we'll actually open this up to a Q&A session. So if you have additional questions about research, if you have additional questions about Berkeley Lab, we'll stick around for about 10 to 15 minutes to allow those questions um, from the audience. And you can put that in the Q&A box or you can put that in the chat box and we'll be able to answer. So words of the day we wanna focus on, X-rays, crystals, lasers, light scattering, X-ray crystallography, as I said before, electromagnetic spectrum, protein, antibody, super, super saturated solutions, and tessellations. Those will be things that we talk about today, so make sure you're listening, but also we have that vocabulary spelled out in the worksheet that we've developed that's on our K-12 um, website. So make sure that you check those out later. And if you're new to this program, we are Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, um, one of 17 Department of Energy National Laboratories. We're located on the West Coast in California. And if you go to symmetrymagazine.org, you can find out a lot more about the other national laboratories throughout the country. Finally, we like to say we have the best view from a lab. This is Berkeley National Laboratory, an overhead shot of it. And in the middle of the screen, we have the topic of our session today, the advanced light source. So have you ever heard of the advanced light source? And if not, you're in luck today because we have our next speaker, Cindy Lee, who will be talking about the advanced light source and she's a science communicator there. So take it off, take it over, Cindy. Thanks, Faith. Hi, everyone. Like she said, I'm Cindy Lee, and I am a science communicator at the Advanced Light Source. So we'll just call it the ALS for short. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. In college, I studied plants and how to make them more nutritious. And then in grad school, I studied breast cancer. These days, my job is to work with the researchers who are doing these experiments and help figure out how to share their results with the world. And we've got some really cool results, so let's get into it. So we just saw the outside of the advanced light source. This is actually what's underneath that dome, but we're not just gonna look at what's you know, really cool on the surface. We're actually gonna dig deeper. So let's look at how we generate light. So we start off with a hunk of metal, and this is a hunk of metal that like, is small enough to fit in my hand. And we heat it up to 1000 degrees Celsius. What that does is it causes electrons to boil off of that metal and we speed them up down the linear accelerator in a straight line. But that's not fast enough. So we send them into a booster ring and that gets them up to 99.99999% the speed of light. That's pretty fast. And when electrons are going that fast, if you give them a little nudge with a magnet, they actually give off light. And it's not just the visible light that we're used to, like that you turn on at home or that you see from the sun. It's actually also x-ray light, infrared, and ultraviolet light. So what do we do with all of this? We send it down these pipes called beam lines, and we actually have 40 of these at our facility. 
And at the end of each of these beam lines, we have researchers who can work at the experimental end stations to do their research. And they might look at things like mummy bones, or they might look at cell phone batteries as they're charging and discharging, or they might even be able to figure out cures for cancer. So we're gonna find out a little bit more about that. And this is just an overhead schematic of the 40 beam lines doing all these different kinds of research at our facility. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dula, who's gonna talk a little bit more about this. All right. Um, hi, everybody. So my name is Dula Parkinson, and um, I am a beamline scientist. So the beamlines that Cindy talked about, I'm the scientist for one of the beamlines. And um, I've worked at the ALS for about 14 years. And before that, I did a PhD in chemistry at UC Berkeley. And um, today, we're talking about x-ray crystallography. And we're going to be, well, a critical part of x-ray crystallography is obviously crystals. And so we're going to be doing a demonstration today with you to grow some of our own sugar crystals. And we're going to be talking more about that later, but right now we just need to get started with the demonstration so there's time to do it all. So we're going to start by boiling some water. So we're going to boil two cups of water. So I'm going to ask my assistant to get two cups of water. And um, we're just going to go over to the stove. And you should ask, uh, if you're younger, you should ask a parent or a caregiver to help you with the stove. But go ahead and just pour the water into the pot. I'm gonna put a lid on it, and I'm just gonna turn the stove on high. And while that's boiling, we are going to measure out the sugar that we need. So, I we're gonna use for um, the amount that I'm doing. I'm gonna use two cups of water and five cups of sugar. If you want to do less, you could do like one cup of um, water and like two and a half cups of sugar. So I'm gonna measure the sugar out in advance because then it's a little easier to keep track of. So I'm gonna ask my assistant to measure five cups of sugar into this bowl. And while my assistant is doing that, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing. So um, what we want is to dissolve all the sugar into the water. And we're gonna end up with what's called a super saturated solution of sugar. That means that like once we cool the solution back down to room temperature, there's gonna be more sugar in the water than there is really happy in the water. And so then that sugar is gonna crystallize. And what we're gonna do is, let's see. Well, as you know, the sugar that we're measuring, it's already tiny crystals, but what we wanna do is use those as seed crystals. And we're gonna grow the sugar from the solution onto those seed crystals until they grow bigger. So this, I was gonna show you, this is what we're going to end up with is this kind of rock candy. Can you go show these closer to the camera? So we're going to be growing uh, rock candy sort of like it's too close. I think it's having a hard time focusing maybe. All right. Anyway, we're going to be growing bigger sugar crystals starting out from the seed crystals. So the first step is to boil the water. So, so you've got the five. Ah. All right, so while um, we're waiting for the water to boil, what I'm going to do is um, we also need to get our seed crystals ready to go. And so for the seed crystals, I'm using, I'm gonna use a few different things. I'm gonna use this wooden chopstick, and I'm also going to use this like wooden skewer, and I'm also gonna use some um, string, just some cotton string, okay? And so what I'm gonna do with these I'm going to get all of them wet. And then my assistant put a little bit of sugar onto a plate. And then we're going to roll the wet stick or the wet string in the sugar. Do you mind doing that? And then do this one and then go show the camera sort of what it looks like. And with the string, I just put a paper clip on the end of the string because that helps it sink down into the liquid later. All right, that's probably good. All right, go show those to the camera. Can you see how 
there's just like little bits of there's really small sugar crystals on there and those are going to be our seed crystals that we're going to grow into bigger crystals and like here maybe you can show the um, comparison so we're starting out with these tiny little seed crystals which are the way the sugar crystals are now and we're going to use a super saturated solution to grow them into bigger crystals okay so i think our water is getting close enough and so we're going to bring our sugar over the water uh, as long as you can see us it's i think it's okay all right oh and so i forgot to say that like i'm gonna get a paper towel and so these um sticks that in the string that we rolled in sugar we're just gonna set those aside and we're gonna let them dry and we'll come back to those later. So now we're going to go over to the stove where our water is getting close enough to boiling. And so I'm gonna take the lid off. And what we're gonna do is we're just going to um, take the measuring cup and you know, like about a cup at a time or a half cup at a time, we're gonna just dump the sugar into the water and then just use like a wooden spoon or some other heat proof spoon to stir the sugar in. So do you want to stir that? So, okay, so he's um, stirring the solution and he's just going to stir it until that sugar dissolves and then he's just going to add some more sugar. And at first, the sugar dissolves pretty quickly, but as you add more and more sugar, it might take a little bit longer for it to dissolve, and that's okay. We're trying to dissolve as much sugar as we can in this solution so that it can become super saturated. All right. So, um, what else was I going to tell you about? Um, oh, so if there's uh, if you're not already too busy doing that, um, what you're going to need for later, for after the solution cools, is some glasses or glass jars. And what I found, like this, is just like a little glass that we had for drinking water. I also got some used like salsa bottles. And so it's just whatever, you know, container that you have that works for you. And also a little bit later, we're going to need either um, tape or a paper clip or something that can help you balance the stick above the jar. So what's going to happen, let's see if you can see this, is that we, you have this stick that's covered in sugar crystals. And we're going to, I'm going to clip it with the paper clip and I'm going to hang it down into the jar you don't want the stick to touch the bottom of the jar so you're going to be hanging the stick down into the jar and holding it with a paper clip or for the string what i'm going to do is i'll like wrap the string around a pencil and then i'm going to use some tape to just attach the pencil to the jar so that it just hangs there so if you have already dissolved your water and um or sorry <laughs> dissolved your sugar then uh, you can start working on that. You can get your jars together and start getting your um, things ready to attach. So how's the sugar dissolving going? Is it done? Yeah. Okay, so our sugar is dissolved here. And so the next step now is to just turn off the um, sugar water solution, like turn off the stove. And now the next step is that we need the sugar, um, super saturated sugar solution to cool. As to cool enough that when we um, pour it in the jar and put the seed crystals in that the seed crystals don't immediately dissolve so That's why we need it to cool down. So we're gonna wait a while to do that So while we're waiting for that to um, dissolve or to cool down. I'm gonna hand it back over to um, Christine to tell you a little bit more about crystals All right, do look good luck out there. I know that my crystals did not grow well, but that's okay Not everyone has the magic touch that you and your family seem to have so I'm Christine Beavers, for everyone tuning in. I am a beamline scientist as well, but I am actually at Diamond Light Source in Oxfordshire, England. 
I used to work at the ALS, but I still love talking about science to the public, so here I am. Uh, I did a PhD at, in chemistry at UC Davis before I joined the ALS in 2009. So we are going to talk about light. When we think about light, we're usually thinking about visible light, but light comes in many flavors. Light is a wave. And so the best way to tell one wave from another is the distance between the peaks, which is called the wavelength. So this diagram that we're looking at right now shows how dramatically different waves can be. Um, it, the waves can be, the wavelength can be in kilometers. The wavelength can be billionth of a meter. So um, it sounds like the screen, can everyone see the screen, this slide? All right, well, the size of the, whoa, okay. <laughs> so we want to take a closer look at waves. We can see how the energy of the light depends on the wavelength. The more wave peaks you can pack into the same space, the more energy the light will have. So the short wavelengths of X-rays and gamma rays means that they have very high energy. So this is why X-rays of the doctors can pass right through you, but visible light doesn't. So we might think that X-rays don't reflect or scatter like visible light but that actually depends on what's doing the scattering. So this little slide is to give us some definitions. So reflected light is a common occurrence and reflecting a laser beam would be just like reflecting an image when we look in a mirror. We will see a dot the same size as the laser beam that we pointed at the reflecting surface. But scattering, as shown on the right, is different. The light waves interact with features on the surface to split the beam in many different directions. The waves will only interact in a scattering type of way if there are features that are close to the same as the wavelength of the light. And so I'm gonna to describe to you a demo that you can do, which I also did, so you can see some light, some laser light scattering. So you have to forgive the art because it was looking like PowerPoint was gonna be just too much work. So I just drew this real quick, but it was a good way to show the setup that I did. You need a red laser, so a cat toy type or a laser pointer. It's good to have a table next to a wall. And then we have a cup, which is just like my yellow Dickies cup that I used. And that cup will be the platform that you can put a variety of different discs. So if you have a CD, a DVD, and a Blu-ray, then you can see, you can best see the difference between them all. A safety note for all you junior scientists, make sure your adults know that you're playing with a laser and never ever point it at another person. Uh, you will want to place your cup on the table about a foot away from the wall. And the wall is where you want to have your laser beam hit. You want to have that stopping the beam. So then if we put our disc on top of the cup, shiny side up, then we have our reflected laser beam hitting the wall. So that'll be the reflection. So anything we see that isn't that reflected beam will be scattering. And so I did this experiment last night in the dark so I can show you the fine details uh, because it, it's kind of hard to see a red laser light sometimes in bright light. So let's take a look at my results. All right, so using the setup described, I first looked at scattering off of a seat. And that should be... Yes, okay. So there we can see the, the brightest spot is the reflected laser beam. But then there's all these other little tiny spots. So those are scattering. And so those other spots are from the laser beam being split by scattering off the little grooves in the CD. So the CD is made up of tiny grooves that, indi that indicate the binary values of the music. And so you either have a hole or you don't have a hole, and that's what's scattering the light. So next, I took a look at the DVD. And so you can see that the DVD is similar. There's still scattering. So we've got a really bright reflected beam and then we've got these little spots for scattering. There's not as many of them. So the beam is not being split as many times because the little grooves for a DVD are much smaller than a CD. So now we do the Blu-ray. The Blu-ray is not very interesting. All we see really is the main reflected beam. And this isn't super surprising. Um, because the data grooves on a Blu-ray are tiny, tiny, tiny. They are much, much smaller. That's how you can fit a whole high-definition movie on a disc the same size as a DVD. And so Blu-rays Blu are actually called Blu-rays because you need a blue laser to read them. And blue light has a shorter wavelength. 
So the features have gotten so much smaller on a Blu-ray that the longer red light, wait, the longer red wavelength light can't scatter off those features. So what we've learned is that to look at very small things, you need light with a wavelength that is similar on a similar scale. So now we're going to take a wild trip into tessellations, which seems like a crazy divergent thing, but it actually will make sense, I promise. So to describe crystals and scattering off of them, we need to talk about tessellations. Now in art, tessellations are a pattern that are repeated, usually in two dimensions. And these, ex these examples on this slide are all by someone very famous called M.C. Escher. Uh, there are a lot of fun websites, especially in the handouts, so you can explore tessellations, but tessellations are also important in crystals, but in three dimensions. How, you ask? Well, how are tessellations and crystals related? Let's take a look. So a crystal is a three-dimensional tessellation of atoms or molecules. Now that seems like a kind of wild idea, so we're going to imagine that instead of atoms or molecules, we have a shoebox. And we are going to tessellate our shoebox. So if we put together a row of shoeboxes, it's a one-dimensional tessellation, a kind of boring one. If we stack those rows, we get a two-dimensional tessellation of shoeboxes. And then if we make a lots of rows of those stacks, then we've made a three-dimensional tessellation. And so that is, crystals are like this, only there are atoms instead of shoeboxes, and they are repeated regularly in all three dimensions. So let's look at what would be in the shoebox for some common crystals. So we go back to what are crystals? Here's some salt, here's some sugar. Even with a microscope, we really can't easily tell them apart. We can see that the salt crystals are a little bit more cubic, and the sugar can be kind of longer in one direction, a little bit more like rectangular sides, but we can't really tell with our eyes what would be in the shoebox. And so what is inside the imaginary shoebox for these two is actually really different though. It would, they're very dramatically different. And so on the left, we have a picture of what the salt crystal looks like. Uh, with purple spheres showing us where the sodiums would be, and green spheres for chlorine atoms. And there's a lot of each, so this is kind of tessellated. We've repeated the pattern a couple times to show you a little tiny piece of what a larger crystal would look like. On the right, we have one sucrose molecule. So you can see this is much more complicated than the single atoms of two different elements that is in the um, salt crystals. So the sucrose crystal, we have the black spheres are carbon, the red spheres are oxygen, and the white ones are hydrogen. So it's really complicated. There's two different ring systems here, There's a six-membered ring, five-membered ring. So sucrose is a pretty complex molecule, but it's actually considered pretty simple considering what we usually look at with crystallography. But you can imagine the sucrose molecule with many, many friends in three dimensions, all sitting next to each other, and that's what makes a crystal. So now we know a little bit about crystals. What Dula's has done is he's dissolved a whole bunch of this sucrose in hot water, and now we are going to wait and see if these sucrose molecules will line up and make some beautiful crystals. So now it's time to go back to Dula and see how things are going in the kitchen. Uh, just before we go back to him, uh, we have a question, Christine. What's your favorite crystal? Ooh, my favorite crystal. That's a toughie. I feel like... <sighs> so... On a side topic, probably my favorite crystal is diamond because I do high pressure experiments where we squeeze other crystals in between diamonds. Um, so that's probably my favorite crystal or the one that I spend the most time with. But every crystal is special and different and unique. So I, I feel I'm fairly equal opportunity. Thanks for sharing. Anytime. All right, I think, Dula, are you ready to share with us again? Yeah, I think I am. Can you see me? Yes. So, um, what we need to do now, so now, uh, I don't know if the solution is completely cold enough, so we'll get as far as we can, but then we might have you hold off and actually like doing the very last bit, but we'll get close. And so what we're going to do now is we, um, if you want, you can have your sugar crystals be colored. And so, 
I'm going to ask my assistant. I think we're going to do uh, three jars today, uh, or I guess these three. And then, um, so he has chosen three different colors. So just put like one or two drops of, you don't need a lot, just a drop or two of food coloring in the bottom of each of these jars. And if you want, you can add some flavoring too. I'm not, we're not going to add any flavoring to ours, um, but I know, right? But we're just, but you can't add a few drops of flavoring too if you want, of different kinds of flavors. So. Wait, can we put some vanilla? Oh. Uh, okay, my assistant, in a minute, my assistant is going to get some vanilla. Meanwhile, did you want the vanilla with, uh, oh, you want that kind of vanilla? All right, we'll see how that goes. All right, no, while no, he's no. getting the flavoring, I'm going to bring the, um, the sugar solution over, and I'm just like, if you have a funnel or something, I used the funnel last time, but and it worked fine, but this time I'm just going to chance it. So I'm just going to pour this sugar solution into my jar and I'm going to pour this sugar solution in here and it should just like mix itself up but if you feel like you need to you can also like stir it in to mix it up better all right you're going to put in some flavoring okay go ahead all right this is uh going to be interesting. He's putting in some kind of weird Kool-Aid flavor. And I don't know if that's going to, a cherry Kool-Aid flavor. I have no idea if that's going to work. It seems like uh, maybe it won't work, but like that's the fun of science. You should just try stuff and you can just see what happens. All right. So now, is that dissolving? Okay. Okay. So once that's done, what we're going to do now is we've got our stick and I'm just going to clip the paper clip so that, so you want to have it so that the stick doesn't go to the bottom. Cause if you, if it goes all the way to the bottom, it, the crystals will still grow. It's just that like they'll grow and also attach to the bottom of the jar and it'll be really hard to get it out. And it'll sort of like the, the, your nice, beautiful crystals will break a little bit when you get them out, which is not the end of the world, but like that's why we suspend it. So it's not going all the way to the bottom of the jar. And you try and just position it so it's sort of in the middle of the sugar solution again, so you don't get, um, so that it doesn't grow to the edge of the jar. All right. Um, I had another clip. We'll just use tape for the other one, Stuart. Okay. All right, here we go. So I'll, I'm just, so this is how you would use tape. So you just put tape across, and why don't you just put that, stick it down in. Um, let's do the stick, and I'll just um, further. And I'll just use tape, and I'm gonna tape it All right, and then the last one, is, you wanna wrap it around the pencil. We're gonna wrap it around a pencil. Um, Should we tape it on the pencil? Yeah. Oh yeah. Just, just roll it some more. It's not a paper clip in All right, and then we'll just put tape over to hold the pencil in place. All right, so now you just have to, uh, so the hardest part for me was actually to find a place in my house where these would not be disturbed for a few days, because it's actually gonna take now a few days for your sugar crystals to grow into these beautiful things. And you can basically let it go as long as you want. Um, we let these, these ones go for about three days, and then we uh, got them out, and so, um, do you, my, my assistant, do you want to give it a try? How, how is the, how's the rock candy? Good. 
All right. Well, so that's that's it. That's how you grow, <laughs> grow your sugar crystals. So I hope that you have su great success at home. And I guess I will turn it back over now. Oh, I forgot. So I, after, you know, like Christine was talking about shooting crystals off of different things. And so I was, the, oh yeah, before I get to that, I forgot about this. Last week when I grew my sugar crystals, I took a time lapse. I got out my GoPro and I took a time lapse of my sugar crystals growing. And unfortunately, like people sort of were turning the lights on and off. So it didn't, like, I don't have the whole thing, but if, um, can you play the movie, Faith? Um, let's see. Uh, I think you need to go back. Is that movie? Did I not embed the movie? Um, I, I don't think we'll, we'll play it at the end. Okay. But we can talk about you light scattering great now. Okay. Sorry about that. My bad. So at the end, I will show a movie of the, uh, of the a time lapse showing the crystals growing. Um, but what I thought would be interesting, you know, Christine was talking about scattering light off of things. And so I have a laser pointer and I was like, okay, what if I point my laser pointer at these crystals? Will I be able to see anything? And so I went into the closet where it's dark and I tried it. And so if you go, so there's my sugar crystals and the, you know, the laser sort of like seemed to be like reflecting off the crystals and but there were some patterns on the wall and then I did it some more and no matter how I pointed it like I kept getting these all kinds of different weird patterns that didn't seem to tell me anything about the structure of the sugar molecules and so it seemed like the laser pointer scattering was not going to sort of tell me about the crystal structure of sugar so I'm going to turn it over to Christine to talk a little bit about why we use x-rays for sc uh, scattering instead of um, laser light. Lewis, can you um, stop? All right, so yeah, it is time to talk again about crystals and shoe boxes. Um, but when we were talking about that, I told you about things where we already knew what was in the shoe box, essentially. But chemists, material scientists, and biologists make crystals of new compounds all the time and x-ray crystallography helps them understand what they've made. We can use the scattering of x-rays by crystals to figure out what atomic arrangement is within the crystal. This is what x-ray crystallography is, and it allows us to make a three-dimensional map of the molecule that is repeated throughout the crystal. So we take a crystal and we put it in the x-ray beam from the ALS, and the x-ray beam is split, so it is scattered. Then we use high-tech x-ray detectors to measure where the x-ray beams split to and how intense each of these beams are. We can use this information and a whole bunch of math to make the 3D picture of the molecule. And so next up, we have actually a video of what this looks like. So you would have to imagine that the x-ray beam would be right in the middle and all of these spots are the x-ray beam being split and they, appear and disappear because the crystal is being rotated in the x-ray beam. So we will do this rotation, take a whole bunch of x-ray images, and then we can use a bunch of math to form our 3D molecular picture. And so yeah, this is how we can do this. This is done every day at synchrotrons around the world, and this is how we learn more about new materials and molecules and also some interesting proteins. So now we've talked about light, x-rays, crystals, and x-ray crystallography. And next up, we're going to have Mark Allaire join us and tell us about how x-ray crystallography can help us understand COVID-19. So Mark Allaire will be joining us, and he will be telling about his part in the crystallography. Mark? Thanks a lot, Christine. <clears throat> so uh, yes, my name is Mark Allaire, and I'm a beamline scientist at the ALS. I've been there uh, <clears throat> for the last seven years. My background is uh, I got my PhD in biochemistry, <clears throat> but then turned into uh, structural, st structural biology and <clears throat> definitely using X-ray crystallography to understand uh, the biology. So I will uh, start sharing my screen. Okay, so uh, I think I'll give you one example of one application that we're currently using X-ray crystallography. And 
everybody is uh, affected like us uh, with the COVID-19, uh, basically this uh, pandemic, which is, uh, I've been in, the <coughs> I've been uh, there for the last uh, three months. I'm sure that you guys uh, have been homeschooled for uh, those many months. So I think uh, this is something new and the same thing for us. Uh, things have been uh, completely uh, shelter in place and trying to respect uh, all the uh, uh, social distancing to uh, prevent uh, the virus in fact. So the COVID-19 virus is basically a, a coronavirus uh, per se. And this is a schematic or a picture of that virus that uh, few may have seen in the past. Uh, in gray, uh, it looks like a little container. So basically, uh, the container contain all the materials that the virus will use when it gets into the cell. The virus will use basically to, re to make new viruses. And then out of that container, you see all those uh, red <coughs> spikes. Uh, this is the spike protein. Uh, basically, the protein is a chain of <coughs> many, many, many uh, atoms. And those spikes protein are basically uh, being used by the virus to, uh, to, to help uh, entry into the cell. So those spikes are no different than your running shoes, the spikes on your running shoes, but the one that you see here are probably about a billion times smaller than the one that you have on your running shoe. So, so the first thing that the virus needs to do is to get into the cell. And I'm showing here a schematic of while the things is happening. It looks really complicated, but indeed it's pretty simple. So this is the virus, then you have the spike and the spike protein will recognize what we call a receptor at the surface of the cell. And then in looking at and binding to this receptor, then the virus will be able to enter uh, the cell. So there's nothing different than if you think about having a key, the spike would be the key that would enter uh, and that would unlock a lock in, and for a door basically so that you can ent enter your house. So it's the same thing here. The key is the spike and then it binds to the lock which is the receptor and then the spike, uh, the virus is able to enter the cell and then start to reproduce and make many, many, many virus. So, so the trick here would be if we can find a way to bind something to the spike and then maybe block the access to the entry of the cell, then this may help you uh, not to be infected. So the way that we do that, the way that uh, we do that in biology is by basically we have what we call our immune system that will start producing antibody. And then at some point of time, some of those antibody will bind the spike and then prevent uh, the entry to the cell. So. Of course, the question is where those uh, antibody binds on the big picture of the spike is something that we want to determine. And this is all where, this is where X-ray crystallography is uh, really, really, really helpful. So there's a lot of X-ray crystallography going on against uh, the fight uh, for COVID-19 right now uh, around the world. And a lot of those are also going on at the ALS. Uh, a lot of that, uh, X-ray crystallography is being done at one of the uh, beamline, beamline 502, one of the beamline that Cindy was talking about, there's 40 of them. So the protein, this one is a protein crystallography beamline, uh, ALS beamline 502. It basically had uh, the place where the sample will be hold. We also have a little robot that I will show later how the robot works. And then on the other side, we have this big detector that uh, Christine was just saying, <coughs> which basically can measure the X-ray diffraction from the sample that we have. So the X-ray would be coming down the pipe this way, hit the samples, and then we get diffraction on the detector. Uh, we need the detector a little bit. This is a little bit like uh, if you go to the dentist and you, you get your X-ray uh, x-rays, uh, basically it's the same thing here. We need a, a detector which would uh, measure the intensity, measure the uh, diffraction from the sample and measure the x-rays that are coming out from the sample. So this robot, uh, the samples are being uh, run at a really, really cold temperature. When I mean really, really, really cold, the uh, liquid nitrogen temperature, which is about minus 320 Fahrenheit. 
and I will show you how the robot mounts a sample uh, on this next video. So everything is done uh, automatically. And Mark, when you get a chance, do you mind turning on your video? I will. Okay, thanks. So this is how the uh, this is how the uh, the sample is being mounted <coughs> on the on on the uh, in front of the X-rays. Uh, I'm trying now to move to the next uh, slide. Okay, so uh, we get uh, basically the antibody that we're looking at is a crystal, exactly like uh, the sugar crystal that uh, Dula was just uh, growing. In this case, it's a little bit, potentially a little bit more small. It's much smaller, maybe a hundred times, a thousand times smaller than the crystal that you will grow at home. Uh, but then the crystal is mounted on this uh, loop. And sometimes when we mount those crystal on the loop, we call that fishing. It's like fishing with your net, uh, a fish from the lake. So it's exactly the same thing. And if you shine x-rays uh, on those crystal, this is on the big detector that you have, this is what you will see. A lot of, uh, a lot of things, but if you zoom on this region, what you will see exactly the same type of diffraction, uh, scattering and diffraction that Christine was talking about those little all those little spots and then the trick in crystallography is to measure the intensity of all those little spots to be on to be able to see the picture of the uh of the protein uh, which is inside uh, which basically makes those crystal and this is what we did with one of the antibody against uh, covid 19 and uh, And this is what it looks like. Uh, this is the antibody. Uh, it's, uh, it seems to be a little bit complex, but again, think about this is the spike protein, the key that would open the lock to enter the cell. And then now we have something that will basically be on top of the key and prevent the spike to get access to the cell, to the receptor of the cell. So, and we get a lot of details uh, from that. Uh, this one is an image, but now let me share uh, what I like to do uh, in crystallography. And sometimes I feel like it's like uh, playing video games. Oh, this is indeed <clears throat> how much details we're getting. And uh, the, we basically have, <clears throat> this is the spike. So this would be the container on this side that we don't see now, which would be gray. And then the spikes protein is coming out, out of that. And then the antibody is basically binding at the tip of the uh, spike protein. So this is where we can block the key to access to uh, to, to access basically to the uh, to entry of the cell. And the thing that I like here is that indeed we can move things, look in 3D, three-dimensional, and then zoom on it. And that's where my video games is fun to play. And indeed, if we don't have enough details, we can look at all these in individual atoms that uh, we saw for the sugar. Now we're going to see that for this antibody and then in this picture all the little balls that you see at cross of intersection are uh, the the atoms that are making this antibody and at the same time that are making the spike protein so so now we can have all the details to know how to develop 
new antibodies or at the same time to know where on the spike protein we can mimic so that we can uh, generate a vaccine to fight against uh, COVID-19. Uh, COVID so, so this is what I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, and now I will bring back the presentation. and move to the next slide. Thank you. So, thanks, Mark, um, and thanks everyone else who um, just spoke today. We are going to transition now. Um, just a quick reminder that next uh, two Fridays from now, July 3rd, will actually be um, talking about sustainability and soil science. Um, but we wanted to give you an opportunity to actually talk to everyone um, after this. So Mark's gonna stop sharing his screen and we're all going to come back on the screen together. Um, and if anybody has any questions about the ALS or about Berkeley Lab, um, so everybody is showing their video. Um, and Dula is coming back on screen. So if you have any additional questions that you didn't ask um, in between, if it's just about rock candy, Jennifer Johnson that's joining us works for JGI, Joint Genome Institute, which we've talked about. Um, Christine just flew back from the UK um, and she works at the Diamond Light Source. Uh, and so everyone has extensive knowledge from a lot of the work that's being done here at Berkeley Lab. So if anybody has any questions, this is your time to add them to the chat box and we'll be looking in the chat box or Q&A to answer those uh, for the next couple of minutes. But I just wanna start off by asking Mark and Dula, Christine, you answered and if you have a second answer, please share. But what are your other favorite crystals? I'm pretty partial to fullerenes, which are carbon spheres. Um, they're very interesting materials. They are basically a ball of carbon shaped like a soccer ball. So hexagons and pentagons made of carbon and they come in a huge number of sizes. So you can have 60 carbons in the classic soccer ball shape or you can have much bigger ones. And that's a lot of what I did with my PhD and I'm still a little nostalgic whenever I see one. Yes, I can add that uh, in structural biology, one of the standard crystal like uh, Dula is doing with sugar is a uh, lysozyme. And uh, if you can grow uh, crystals of lysozyme, which is a protein, in uh, quite an easy way of doing it. So, so lysozyme is certainly something that uh, all, all of our biologists knows to, to do, to grow. That's the first one that you you have to do, and if you're unsuccessful, then it doesn't look uh, promising for your career, so. Dula, Cindy, your favorite crystal? Or protein? I have to say my favorite crystal actually comes from my love of baking and my love of cake. So I think the secret superstar in a lot of dessert recipes is actually salt, which is a crystal. And you need that salt in your uh, baking. There are different theories as to why. Some people say the crystals help organize all of the other ingredients that are in your baked good. Um, so we'll see what other people might have in terms of that theory. But I think that's a secret superstar in a lot of our desserts. So that's my favorite. Uh, <clears throat> so I don't think I have a favorite crystal, but um, I have been for the last year or so I've been sharing an office with someone named Simon Teach, who's the chemical crystallographer for the ALS. And he, the thing that is amazing to me is just how many different crystals he studies. So almost every day in the mail, someone ships him a box with um, samples full of crystals that he's going to analyze. And so what's amazing to me is just how many different kinds of crystals there are out there. Crystals can be uh, extremely colorful at some, sometimes as well. So. 
And from our audience from Palace, I hope I are Palat, are there crystals that can't be characterized through ALS and what what qualities makes them not be able to be characterized? So a lot of what we do when we're looking at crystals depends on the crystals having that really good repeating order. So we need those shoe boxes to be very consistent and repeating in all three dimensions. And sometimes crystals aren't as ordered. Sometimes they don't behave as nicely as we'd like them to. And so if we think about it, what if the shoe boxes were a little squished or if they weren't lined up very well? That's called disorder. And so in materials, we see that as well, where the atoms aren't always in the same repeating position. And so there's kind of a continuum between nicely ordered and completely random. And at some point along that spectrum, we can't get information about the atom positions anymore. And so then you have to use other techniques. Um, you want to do scattering, which doesn't require as much of a dependence on the ordering. And you can learn more. It's harder to do with ALS, but it can still be done. And of course, there's other techniques to learn about how atoms are hooked to each other, like spectroscopy. And sometimes it's <clears throat> sometimes it's really uh, difficult and possible to grow uh, some crystals of certain proteins. So uh, we can we can grow a lot of uh, crystals from proteins, but some of them are doesn't want to grow. And in that case, you rely on other technique, like uh, Christine was just saying, to, to get the structure of the protein. So. So we have another question, which is how has the shelter in place affected the work done at the ALS? Are you able to work remotely or work with precautions? So maybe, maybe we could ask uh, Cindy first to talk about that and I can certainly have something uh, uh, for uh, the remote, remote aspect. So Cindy, do you want to step in and say something about the ALS and the shelter in place? Definitely. So, you know, like everybody else, we want to make sure that our communities are safe, our loved ones are safe. And so we've been trying to be very careful. And of course, we're acting in accordance to the local guidelines. We're in Alameda County, which has been um, in shelter in place since March. So that was something that we considered. How do we balance the safety of our community and our staff? while doing this very important work. So some of us like me have been working from home since March and some people like Mark have been going in to help process these COVID related samples. Um, but going forward, uh, it is something that our facility has to consider because part of what makes our facility such a great place to work is that we have people who come from all over the world who have all sorts of different scientific backgrounds and expertise who work together and you know team science is a huge part of Berkeley Labs environment and you know if we can't all get together in person how are we going to still do such amazing science going forward and it's something that we take very seriously um, it's not just the scientists who are thinking about this it's all the other people at Berkeley Lab are really thinking how can we continue these amazing collaborations um, so, you know, we are trying and everybody's going to have to be a little bit flexible, but we are going to keep doing amazing science. So on the, uh, on the uh, ALS uh, protein crystallography beam line, there's a lot of uh, operation that are being done remote. So uh, I've shown a video of the robot that are mounting samples. So indeed we can uh, we can mount over 164 samples in the robot and people can from the from their home or can basically uh, connect to the beam line and collect all the data that they need so we don't need to have people on site for that kind of operation we need one person to go on site which i've been doing sharing with another uh, colleague kevin royal and but basically we load the samples and then everybody is collecting from their home uh, remotely and get access to their uh, their information their diffraction from their crystals so. so another question from the chat box what's the biggest challenge while being a scientist the journey to being a scientist so what's your biggest challenge in becoming a scientist and 
your biggest challenge of being a scientist? Uh, I'll start. Uh, the biggest challenge of becoming a scientist, uh, certainly there's many years of uh, education that you have to do, but to some extent you get, you have to find what you love to do. For me, uh, structural biology was the perfect match because it combines, uh, I, I used to say, uh, we're basically uh, using uh, physics and maths to understand the chemistry of the biology. And for me, I love all the aspect of uh, all the field in science. So I, re I really love that. So uh, after that, uh, I love to go to work. Uh, of course, nowadays, uh, it's not exactly the case, but uh, I like to go and uh, do structural biology. So I I, I just love to do what I'm doing. So I, that's, that, that would be my short answer. I'd say that definitely the challenge is finding the place where you feel you can be interested and motivated on a regular basis because there's so many areas of science. Like science is huge and broad and not every area of science will appeal to you on a daily basis. And I've found that the mixture of team science and community science at a synchrotron has been a place where I have felt at home. And I think having that place is the most important thing and the most difficult as a scientist to find your place. Um, I guess for me, I, I, I really liked what the other said. Um, I remember in college, being, um, I, my first chemistry class and my uh, when someone in my study group I just remember thinking like that he was the true scientist in our group and because of just the way he approached it and he just seemed so like so much like a scientist and now it turns out he's a lawyer and I'm the scientist um, <laughs> and but uh, he I guess so for me it's part of the journey of being a scientist is just realizing that the strengths that I have are valuable as a scientist and even if those aren't you know the stereotypical scientist things um they're still valuable in science yeah i think i could say honestly that people at synchrotrons we are an interesting mix of scientists because what we do is so collaborative we are never an island we are scientists who work with scientists and so having good social skills and liking to work with people is actually a very valuable uh, aspect to us. Uh, <clears throat> that's correct. And yeah, we're basically enabling the science of uh, other folks. And uh, like the work that I saw that I showed on COVID-19 is indeed the work from uh, David Vissler at the University of Washington in collaboration with the, uh, David E. Um, uh, Corto at uh, Veer Biotechnology. And we have tons of uh, people that are, uh, to some extent, counting on us to provide, uh, to help them in getting the right data. And this is a collaborative work that I just love to talk with other people about what are they doing and uh, what kind of science they are doing. So I, I fully agree with that. And sometimes it is hard. So it's helpful to have a good team around you. I know when I was in grad school, there were times when my experiment hadn't worked for a month and I still had to push myself to go into lab, set up the experiment again and make sure that I believed that someday it would work. Um, you know, we saw Dula set up his crystals today. Um, I know several of us also tried this at home and mine failed pretty miserably. I think that I put my uh, skewer in too early and so the sugar just dissolved. So it does take perseverance. Um, a lot of times your experiments won't work and you just have to keep pushing. I think that's a good note to end on, Cindy. Um, keep pushing, keep trying. We research and then go back. Um, someone used to say a long time ago, it's called you search and then you research um, because that's what science definitely ends up being. Um, so again, um, thank you to all of our scientists who joined us today from our different light sources. Um, and next 
in two weeks, we will have um, scientists from the Earth and Environmental Sciences area talk to us about soil and sustainability and how to create your own compost at home. So thank you everyone and have a good weekend.